Jim, and an analogy that I often use is that of the kitchen stool. And I talk about this as if my life has been two different kitchen stools. My previous kitchen stool that I was sitting on had multiple supports, but there was one that was much larger than the other supports underneath it. And that was the constant grind that I was living in. And then I decided that I had a choice. I could create my ideal life, which consisted of different supports underneath my stool that were in balance. And I chose those supports to be things like physical health, emotional health, mental health, spiritual health, relationship health, financial health. And then I started to manifest, how do I go from the actual self where I was at to this new version that I pictured in this new stool with these different supports that were in harmony with each other. And I bring this up because manifestation can be a tricky thing. A lot of people don't want to believe in it. And you mentioned in the book about the unfortunate misunderstandings surrounding manifestation that are often skewed towards materialism. How does your approach in Magic Mind aim to correct these misconceptions and realign the practice with more meaningful life outcomes? Well, what we were talking about earlier in some ways about religion, through hundreds, if not thousands of years, through repeated experience, there are certain truths that we have learned that are deeply embedded in us. But because of our lack of knowledge, we wrap a dogma around them. And so what we find is that things, as an example, like manifestation, they do have a kernel of truth to them, but it is wrapped around what you could call or pseudoscience. As an example, if you look back to a term that's frequently associated with the blue side of manifestation, it's this law of attraction, which began in the first and second century AD with the Hermetics, who had this concept of what's above connects with what's below. And this was looking for something outside of yourself or some sort of magic or power or omniscient being that will judge you worthy, and then you get what you want if you're only aligned with, quote unquote, the universe. Of course, the problem with that is on some level, you can actually beat yourself up or creates a, a negative because you're saying, well, it didn't happen, therefore I'm the problem. And of course, that's not true at all. The reality is that the universe could care less about you. What we don't understand is the power within ourselves to change our lives. And this power is extraordinarily powerful. And we have to reclaim our agency. As an example, I was telling you about, I kept looking outside for the universe to make me whole or these external affirmations. And the reality, as you have learned, and I have learned is that you are the only person who can make you happy. But what the interesting paradox is, you're the only person you can that can make you happy, but you have to then look outside of yourself for those actions and interactions in the world and with others that will give you that gift of happiness. And you can understand how powerful that is. A minute ago, we were talking about goals, aspirations, or attachment to uh, a goal. And the problem with that, as you were pointing out for yourself, your existence was based on this stool that was held up by the this belief that to make you whole was to accomplish. The problem with that is in many ways, that is an I or me focused narrative. And the problem is when you're so attached to attaining those goals or climbing that mountain, it comes at an extraordinary cost. And often that cost is lack of relationship with those around you, your loved ones. And this is why often so many people who have been so driven have been through multiple divorces. They don't know how to have relationships because everything about them is focused on the me I want and this false narrative that if I get it, then everything suddenly is going to uh, be perfect and it, do it doesn't happen because the the power of these achievements actually must be looked at in the context of by achieving this, one, how does it benefit the greater world, but also understanding that on that path, it's not the end point, it is the path itself. And it is on that path where you develop relationships, connections, 
And we know from looking as an example at the blue zones, where these villages or places in the world where people live routinely over 100, which represents how we lived uh, a few hundred years ago or a few thousand years ago, or uh, the work uh, that's been done at Harvard over the last 85 years on the adult development study, which many people call the happiness and longevity study. What we know is that the way to decrease engagement of our sympathetic nervous system, our flight, fight, or fear response is through what? It's through connection. It's through support from others. It's from depth of relationships. When you have that, that shifts you from engagement of your stress mode to engagement of your parasympathetic nervous system, which is that system when one is engaged, makes you happy and fulfilled because you're caring for others, but it also makes your physiology work its best. So when I said earlier that attachment or craving or this desire that goes deep into you to achieve, when that is what you're focused on, that in and of itself is going to create suffering. There's nothing wrong with having the goal. It's what you're attaching to the goal and its importance. And if it, the cost of achieving that goal is at the sacrifice of everything else, what is it that you've done and why are you doing that?